everybody. Welcome to the Hop and Brew School podcast. I'm Justin Crosley. And I'm Nick Ziegler. And we are back to teach you, help you, connect you with some of the best brewers and hop information uh, so that we can all make better beer. I totally. paraphrase this time. You did, but it's a totally self serving enterprise. We just want better hoppy beer that's clean and delicious. That's right. And why not, after all? Yeah. We drink enough of it. Uh, well, you know, we are trying to keep people in business. So. Yeah, that's right. We're just doing our part. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Nick Ziegler, uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, we got another couple of uh, episodes that we'll be recording and putting out here pretty soon. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about uh, hop profiles and, and how to blend hops, uh, both how you all do it at Yakima Chief and how uh, uh, professional brewers and, and home brewers can do it themselves, right? Absolutely, and uh, I salute your use of y'all, which is, I think, one of the finest words in the it, English language. It's, there's not really another word that is that perfect for almost everything. I mean, I mean it's, it's all y'alls, y'all, yeah. uh, all y'alls better know. You know, it's just, it works. Yeah, there's just not much else you can use beside that one. Uh, there's another word we're going to use for today's show, too. Uh, we're going to teach folks about cluster fug it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's 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 <laughs> this is a hot blend that we're we're, we're releasing soon. This uh, is an actual hot blend. By this the is way? an actual hot blend, okay. and so, so I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But yeah. so you know how a lot of the the European languages have have very strict rules about introducing new words into their lexicons. Yeah. So uh, I do apologize to everyone in marketing, but I'm going to get a little bit dirty on this one. <laughs> uh, Germany or the German Language Institute, I guess what it was. Uh, they came up with uh, two of the words, that, and they actually adopted two words from English, and they'd never really done this before. And mm -hmm. This is a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and because they said, well, there are no uh, words in German that adequately describe this phenomena. Okay. And uh, the two words were yes. clusterfuck <laughs> yeah. and shitstorm. Right. Uh <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's kind of it kind of works. So the me. thing is, it's not just the it's not just the Germans. My my friends from uh, France love the English language for the same thing that we we just we're good at putting things together to describe something that can't be described any other way. <laughs> exactly. And funny, I think I think we actually inherited that that sort of putting stuff together from the Germans, which is they, they just they just kind of layer words together and then put And they them keep in, going put, by the way. They just put a compactor and there's like yeah. like if you look at was it is it Wissenschaft or Wissenschaft the studio it's like it's these re, like my apologies to Germans. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully getting married to one two weeks <laughs> to before, all of uh, unless unless she gives unless she just decides that I'm not worth it. Good which luck. is you know quite possible. Yeah. Uh, but the hilarity of the German language is, uh, it, it's just, what they combine is ridiculous. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, um, it is amazing. Well, today we're going to be talking about combining hops uh, for hop blends, um, and we're going to be talking about different flavors that you're looking for. Uh, as you do that, we're going to get down into the weeds like we normally do um, and just help you out with that. Uh, before so, uh, we got to let you know about a couple of things. The actual Hop and Brew School is coming up I mean, it's not like right around the corner, but before you know it, it's going to be here. Uh, it's over Labor Day weekend up in Yakima. And how many years have you guys been doing Hop and Brew School? Do you know? It's It's been a while. I think uh, I've been hearing about it for a long time. Yeah, it's a, it's close to a decade, I think. Wow. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm actually fairly new at Yakima Chief, which is, sure. you know, again, privilege. But I can I, tell. Actually, you know, <laughs> I, I curse. Uh, but I've... Uh, I've spoken at a couple of them, and we've got a great lineup of speakers this year. Uh, we've actually had another request for someone to come and speak at it, which is really cool. Um, I can't tell you who that is because we're you know working on that one yet. But we've got Vinny Solorzo as our keynote, which uh, is yeah. always awesome. That is awesome. Uh, and we've got some folks from White Labs discussing uh, a, a bunch of stuff about yeast. So it's not this is not just hops; it's hops and brew school. So we're talking about brewing techniques, uh, you know, other ingredients. We've got uh, we've got some some seminars on malt. And a sort of a, a market report on malt coming from, I believe it's Great Western. Uh, and we've got just a ton of farm tours. It's going to be really fun. We're feeding y'all. We're definitely feeding us beer, lubricating y'all mm -hmm. uh, with 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 beer. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's 
it's it's a great time and um i can't wait um it's starting the welcome reception is on friday august 30th and uh and then it just it keeps going all the way through to monday you can go to yakimachief.com slash events right now and check it out and um i'm really looking forward to it a bunch of my friends have gone in years past and and have always told me to make it so I think I'm driving the old battle wagon up there, the RV. Uh, we will have a hookup spot for you. It may involve some buckets and an old pump from the brewery, but we will have something for you there. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of inviting Vinny to roll up with me. I oh. mean, I know the guy's probably busy as hell, but once I heard he was the keynote, I was like, how cool would a road trip with Vinny be? And we'll just stop at breweries all along the way. Dude, you should just film that. That would be amazing. <laughs> That's just, just, the you know, other just thing. Just have, like, you know, sort of do the top tier thing, have a bunch of GoPros in, yes. in the RV. <laughs> That's well, exactly what I was thinking. Most places in the RV. That would be awesome. That would be hilarious. I'm going to ask him anyway. Because what if yeah. I don't? And he was like, dude, I haven't, I'd have done that in a second. You know? You, When's you, the last time he had a good, you know, debaucherous road trip? Uh, <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. He's been building a brewery for the last three years, you know? Dude, uh... Natalie, I'm very sorry that we got to this point, but you <laughs> yeah. are also welcome. We will happily fly you up so right. that you can just meet them, and we'll give Vinny a day to recover. Yeah, but, uh, that's a good yeah. idea. She doesn't need to deal with me. <laughs> yeah. Just the amount of beer farts, dude. <laughs> All right. Also, uh, coming up even sooner, we're going to be at the uh, Homebrew Con in Providence, Rhode Island. Yakima Chief will be there. The Brewing Network will be there. And, of course, we're having our 14th anniversary party bna 14 is happening at fet music hall in providence rhode island and uh get your tickets now go to thebrewingnetwork.com buy your tickets 35 bucks and then it's all you can drink you get to hang out with me and bevo and uh, uh so hang on yeah we talked about this last show mm. but are we actually invited you guys yeah you're not just invited you are our vip our sponsors so Yakima Chief will be on hand in the beginning to hang out, probably give away some goodies, and uh, make sure that you have a special time during our VIP hour. And those tickets are going fast, by the way. They'll be they'll be sold out in another week, so go get your VIP tickets if you want that. And the time will be special. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'll be there. I, I think... No, no, yeah, so I, I, we're not recording until later in that day, so I'll have to be sober. Uh, but yeah, you get to talk to all of us, and um, we've got a bunch of personalities and we're going to be available to actually discuss stuff with y'all so we're not just going to be there and like hiding in a corner that's right scared of crowds <laughs> uh but we've got uh we've got a lot of people experts there we've got our uh sensory lead there she's she's awesome she's going to be able to help you guys uh you know go through a lot of topics and discuss stuff uh we're gonna have i think we're doing a panel discussion at some point or yeah, we're gonna do a few recordings it's gonna be fun mm -hmm. uh so please come on over come by the booth and uh get ready for the party it'll be a blast yeah i'm excited go to the brewing network.com and uh get your bna 14 tickets go to homebrewcon.org if you haven't gotten your tickets to that yet and come hang out with us it'll be a good time all right i think that is that's all the updates i have for you folks so we can we can dive into the goods now. And uh, so Nick came in and said, listen, I know that we've, we've covered a little bit of this, but I really wanted to get in there and talk a little more about how we blend hops and how you brewers can, can blend hops. So maybe start us off with some of the principles. Like what are the principal components that you all look at um, when getting into blending? Okay, so um, I'm going to go a little bit historical on this. And we've, we've talked about this before, how – our understanding of hop character and our approach to uh, what we define as hop character has changed over the last, well, it's going to be about 20, 25 years at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, it really does have to do with the, the, the aromatic top notes and, and, and the craft beer revolution. Um, but principally, originally, the main component that people were concerned about was uh, were alpha acids. Okay. Um, and so they would blend to create either a stable alpha acid profile, uh, and that was one of the things that was done with a lot of uh, P90 or T90 hops. Uh, so it's taking the whole cone, grinding them up, pelletizing them, mm -hmm. um, or uh, making a concentrated version of that, which is the T45 hops, uh, which is the uh, uh, a standardized alpha. So okay. not stable. Stable is not the right word, but it's standardized alpha, which means that you're always going to get 7, 14, 13, 15, whatever percent it is from that variety because they remove a certain amount of the, of the uh, leaf fraction. Okay. Um, so, okay, so when you say that, they standard like year over year, is that what you mean? That, that they'll just decide if it's T45 and it's uh, Citra, for example. I don't well, know you what. wouldn't want to do that to Citra, okay. but yeah. Give me a hop. Give me Sons. a Okay. 
T45 sauce, year over year over year, it's going to be the same alpha acid. That's, so, that was so, the principle take, there? So, so okay. originally, the reason it's called T45, it's actually normally about T63 now because agronomic techniques have gotten better and processing has gotten better. But back in the day when they came up with the concept and did the experiments, they needed to make it a T45. So 45% of the original matter. And that brought it up to, I believe, 7%. Um, okay. And so that just happened to do with the lots that they had and the concentration level. Okay. Um, and their goal was to create a uh, a product that floor brewers could use and just follow the SOP and not have to sort of you know do any calculations in the back of a napkin. Okay. Because when you're when you're brewing four batches back to back and you've got three in the you know you, you got three in the pipeline, it's it's hard to do that. It's you don't have a lot of time. Um, sure. So you want to make sure that things weighed out properly and, and, and done. So that was a really easy way for uh, brewers to uh, or for, for, for hop companies to add value to uh, their brewing partners by providing them something that didn't require a lot of thought. Consistency. Well, consistency, and it's also just more of like, a, okay, just grab bag A, dump in kettle. Okay. That was it. You know, it was easy. But that was, you know, just focusing on uh, bitterness. And you would you would take different lots and you 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 know combine them to make sure that you had a standardized alpha level. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and that's actually you know sort of one of the reasons that cry was different is that we don't actually care about well we do care about the alpha but we 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 primarily judge it based on aromatics. Okay, and so we actually designed that process um, in the cryo hops. In the cryo hops, yeah. Mm -hmm. So people have said that oh cryo hops are the same as T forty five. No, they're not. T forty fives were created for a very specific purpose, which is standardized. Alpha. alpha acids to add to your hot side to make sure that it was it, it helped you you know create a more lean mm -hmm. profile in your brewery basically. and cryo hops are standardized they're aromatics not, they're not, not standardized, standardized. Okay. no so that we we celebrate the the lots lot variability and we celebrate that and that cryo hops are really focused on preserving the aromatic integrity of either that hop okay or, or the, so that hop lot or those blends of hops of hop lots that the brewers have selected, and so this kind of uh, this is a reason for me. Talk, I'm talking about this is brings us back into the whole, the whole blend you. concept. Yeah. So the principal components that you're interested in hops, there's always going to be the alpha acids, and then there's going to be your total oil, mm -hmm. and then there's the breakdown of the oil within that. And I'm, I'm ignoring beta and polyphenol for now, folks. I understand that. We'll get to those in later episodes. I'm sure but, someone will correct us before we get to that. We've been getting a lot of feedback lately. I, uh oh, no, it's all good. Okay, okay, but you, well. you've already heard some of it where they're like, um, "Actually, Nick said Nick said one word wrong." <laughs> so anyway, carry on. No, actually, honestly, I kind of like that because it, it keeps me um, uh, enraged. I mean, honest. We uh, love the feedback. No, it's actually really good. So thank you guys. And you know, I think we called out and uh, responded to some of that uh, one of the last episodes. And I hope to do that again. And I would love to do that live at HomebrewCon. Um, Mostly because I'll have a lot of experts behind me to help me. Mm -hmm. But uh, moving on. Anyway, um, so when you get the total oil percentage, that is your quantity of compounds or quantity of oil that might contribute the aromatics that you're looking for. And so a, a long, you know, not even a long time ago, even hell, seven years ago, hmm. people were, were looking at total oil as a defining character of what the aromatics were. Well, the problem is, is that throughout the growth cycle of the plant, depending on when it's harvested, depending on where it's grown, mm -hmm. depending on how old the rootstock is, depending on the weather that year, depending on the variety, um, the proportion of the components within that oil will be very different. Okay. So you can get something that's got, you know, you can get something with a 3% oil, and you're like, oh, this is fantastic. This is huge. It's going to add so much aroma. Well, yeah, it's going to add a lot of aroma, but is it the aroma that you want? Okay. And so you need to explore those hops rub them break them down and say okay well hang on this has this much citrusy this has much, this much onion this has much this much pine and uh if you're trying to create a beer out of these hops you can sort of build it from that point or if you're trying to flavor match to something you're looking at okay hang on what are the things that i'm actually getting out of my hops in my current process that i'm trying to recreate and i want to have a consistent beer year on year okay and part of the part of part of that is i mean it's hops are we've talked about this before hops are an agricultural product mm -hmm. we are doing our best to make sure that y'all get the best hops for you yeah that, that you get to taste and you get to select and you get to, to have every year but we have to deal with the vagaries of nature and life so in in 
to put it in perspective for me, and I have a feeling this is going to be a stupid question, but uh, is this like why we have CTZ? Is that a blend that's looking for like consistency? It's just like the first thing that I think that comes to mind. Um, yes, no. Well, CTZ is an interesting one. That that has to do with uh, all sorts of trademarks and okay, that's suits fair. Suits and then, countersuits. But is so it was not designed to th that type of blend was not designed for what you're describing. So CTZ is not a blend. Oh. CTZ is... Why does it come from the name of three different fucking hops, then? Because they're not different hops. Oh, I see. So, so it really was a trademark issue. Oh, yeah. No, it, it, and, and, there was, and there was some... Uh, we, we would l gently call it uh, some perhaps ill-advised, possibly unauthorized distribution of germplasm. Okay. Well, this is very likely to be cut out. So let me ask you, <laughs> let me, let me ask you a, a different way. Uh, what is an example of a blend that I might have heard of that is seeking this purpose? Okay, so you have um, does this? I, I'm gonna back up from that concept for a second. So there's a couple different things. There's um, brewers selecting a blend mm -hmm. for their own purposes. Okay. There is brand definition, which is that within a brand we have certain limits there where if things are too far outside of it, we say, okay, that's not actually representative of Citra. We need to look at that field. Perhaps it, it had a uh, it had behaved. It had undergone different stressors, or maybe there were some off types gone in there, or something happened. You mm -hmm. know, maybe it got overheated at some point, whatever. And so we're like, nope, we're not going to release that citrus. That's not that's not part of our quality thing. We want to make sure that people get what they're expecting. Okay? I see. Okay. But within those bars, there's you know there's top end and low end for alpha and oil and beta and. You're not just going to throw away a bunch of citra because it wasn't in the perfect thing. Is it that... wasn't the perfect thing. So, yeah. so, but well, no. So we won't we won't necessarily release it as citra. If it's if it's not perfect, we might extract it. However, mm -hmm. if you're doing a big group blend, or if uh, so, if you're doing something, so you know, most of our customers aren't actually able to select our hops because you have to have five thousand pounds or more of a single variety. Okay. To be able to select and goes up in that in that, that sort of increment. Um, and so if we have, uh, you know, 30 breweries in a region. That are all below the 5,000 threshold. And they all want Citra. And yeah. they all, and you know, say, okay, well, hang on. You, you all together mm -hmm. brought this up to 25,000 pounds. Well, okay. Let's, let's, let's put you down in front of a bunch of lots and, and, and see what you like. I see. And so they can create that blend together. And so that, that is now their Citra as, as a group. Got and it, that, and, and we will keep that. That's that's we run that together. That sounds more fun than picking it by myself. Uh, it can be. It can actually be really problematic though because people want different formats. Yeah, and also people want different things. And we've talked about this before. So so remember, you used to hate Simcoe because you had a different experience of it than 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 you expected. Yeah, and now you don't hate it, right? Because Jeremy showed you the difference between different lots of Simcoe. Am I allowed to say why I didn't like it, or is that is that of course? Because yeah, cat piss is why. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the f one of the major descriptors from the Germans, mm -hmm. my apologies to my Bathhouse colleagues, uh, is that uh, Citra tastes like cat piss. Yeah. When it's really, really advanced. Right. And, so when it's and that's what Jeremy from Lagunitas taught me because he's like, oh, yeah, no, I hear you. Now, now smell this one. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, that smells great. Now I see why everybody likes Simcoe all of a sudden. Right. Now, here's the thing. When you're using it in beer, we've talked about some of the thiols behaving differently and, and converting in the process and, and changing and, and having a lifting or a, a subduing effect on some of the other compounds. Yeah. If you want to get the fullest expression of a hop, you actually do want some of those weirder characters that you may not like on their own. So when you're making a group blend or you're making a, uh, as a brewer, say someone who's taking 400,000 pounds of a single variety, you actually want some of the dankness, even though it's not something that you like in your beer. Hmm. You want a little bit of that to kick it up a notch or, or draw it down. So you're trying to balance these these concepts and these flavors together to create the the, the, the character that you want. I understand. And that. And, and so so when we talk about principal principal components, I can look at this from a, a you know a mass spectrometry mass spectrometry perspective and be really really focused on individual compounds and chemicals. And that's when I call Pat and go. Dude, can you describe to me the flavor of a tabby cat, tomcat versus <laughs> like a tortoise shell? And he gives you like the chemical compound <laughs> uh, makeup of that smell. And exactly how it interacts with your nose. Yeah, it's fine. I see. Okay. Uh, but uh, in actual reality, it's, it's okay, hang on. We want 
we find that this little amount of, of what is traditionally in, in high concentrations a negative character actually lifts the entire aroma profile of the hops, and we pay more attention to the piney, hmm. citrusy, lemony, berry flavors. That's crazy. In, in Simcoe. It's, it's, it's really cool. So we so, so, so brewers do this, um, and they have been doing this for a long time. A lot of them have their own notes, but I've found that most of you all just kind of go, I like that one. I want that one. Like when I ask you to fill out a form, you mm. don't do it. So now you're doing it online. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to make it better. And it's just to get better data for y'all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there goes y'all again. Um, but the whole, the whole point is that we're, we're trying to create something that brewers want best. And so brewers are going to do that for themselves. But when we don't have a huge amount of hops going to one brewery, yeah. and we've got a lot of different options for a lot of different breweries, we strive for the pruder optimality, which is, you know, people are going to criticize me for saying this, but it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the most good for the most people. Yeah. And yes, I know that pruder optimality is so, actually the least bad for the least people. Well, but. so I get that part of it. I, I could see how that might be a criticism, but it, you're also, it's an opportunity because otherwise these folks, you know, might not have been able to select hops at all, right? And so I'm not defending either side per se. I'm just saying that that's like glass half empty kind of attitude, right? right? So because I all of a sudden just became a brewer who gets a little hand, it gets a little say in, in the hops I'm going to get now by this blending process. And what we have seen, and what's really interesting about this, is that we, 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 we've battled with this concept because we don't want to like force people to take the same stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, we have seen serious regional differences. In, 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 in brewers oh pallets yeah. yeah oh yeah so like there 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 are like we can we can say okay within this these three cities and this this much population people tend to seem to pick this stuff right and these are all popular breweries oh that's fascinating it's really cool. you guys have data sheets on that too uh, i or cannot this, i can neither confirm like just... nor deny uh, <laughs> yeah but it's it's really fun okay. and um but what we're, we're what, I, what i'm trying to do is i'm i'm trying to you know, as with all the data sheets and let's just be honest and, and all the toys and all the sensory and all that stuff is we're trying to leverage this to give you stuff. And, and I'll put lots in front of people that I'm pretty sure they're going to like. And I'm always going to put negatives in front of people that I know they're going to hate. Okay. And then in between then, there's going to be a spectrum of different stuff. So it's, I'm always going to try to put more that you're going to like yeah. in front of you. But if there's something that I think, okay, you may not like this particular lot for this characteristic, but it's got this other one that you seem to really care about, mm-hmm. and you can then combine that in the blend. So, for example, uh, peach is is a character, and melon are two characters, or cantaloupe specifically, uh, are two characters characteristics that uh, aren't in the traditional lexicon, as it were. Um, they're just classified under stone fruit and Mm. grassy melony mm-hmm. uh but there's a they're, they're distinctive you know they're they're distinctive from other stone fruit they're distinctive from other melon um and people get really excited about those but it's really hard to get those into beer uh actually lugney this is a is it not a little something but it's a what's their session something one it's the uh hell i just put a six pack of it in the fridge it's little something something no it's the other little something it's baby something no I Damn it! Know. It's the white. Anyway, that has a. You just filled my fridge with it, though. Uh, I like that beer. Oh no, that one's in my hotel room. Ah. Shit, I'll, I'll bring it tomorrow. Uh, anyway, um, but it's a. Uh, it's a, that beer really expresses that that peach character, and to to Jeremy and to his crew, that's a really important thing. But it's not something that appears on on the lexicon as, as normal. So we try to capture that and make sure that they're able to fill in their descriptors, and mm-hmm. then that sort of fits together and we have so okay okay anytime we anytime we get a we get a hop that comes in uh, on on intake and we smell it says peach i'm gonna flag that okay jeremy's probably gonna like that it might be mm. oh but i think uh, okay you know martin from brudo might be interested in that as well um i think so uh, that's Hill cool. says gonna you get be, to yes. know what they like yeah yeah and we're trying to we're trying to help people get what they want and also expose them to concepts and and flavors they might not know they like they okay. may not have isolated but like okay well hang on these compounds are kind of related Let's put this in front of you. See what see see what goes. All right, I'm going to get us to a break, and then when we come back. I'm going to relate to this a little bit. I got to do an anniversary beer blend with uh, the Rare Barrel, Ooh. and and me and and some of my team got to go down and check that out. And I'm going to talk about how Jay kind of did that same thing with us uh, to help us get to a final product that I never would have thought we I would have picked. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more on the Hop and Brew School podcast. Hang in there.
Welcome back to the Hop and Brew School podcast. Today we are talking about blending hops um, and, and, and how to put hops together and, and, and get different things that you might have thought you were going to get out of them. And when you were describing this to me before the break, Nick, I, I thought of this experience that I had, as I had mentioned, um, we're coming up on our fifth anniversary here at my tap room in uh, Concord, California, called the Hop Grenade. And... Uh, Jay, uh, Jay Goodwin down at the Rare Barrel, Jay and Alex there, um, had invited us to do an, an anniversary blend, which oh, was just like... Jealousy I, and score. <laughs> I mean, my favorite, uh, you know, sour brewery on the planet, and so really nice of them to do that. And so me and a few of my team went down to do this, and the way, you know, Jay... <laughs> I love seeing uh, friends at work sometimes. You know, have you ever have that experience where, you know, when you're with friends, you're... You're having fun. You're 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 one person, and then when you see a, a, a your friend being the professional that they are, doing the the very thing they were like born to do, it's like uh, oh, you're just that dude who does this <laughs> stuff, and you're like oh, actually, actually, you're kind of a badass. This guy like knows what's <laughs> happening, and he, and he, of course I knew that, but to watch him at work, and so he he uh, has beer in a, a bunch of graduated cylinders, and um, we sample each of these on their own, and they're from they're from different barrels. Mm-hmm. And the reason I can relate here is that there were times when we would try these on their own, and I would go like, well, I don't like that. Um, and then maybe another one, and I, I don't like that very much. And then he would sort of go away, do something, give it back, and, and I'd go, oh, well, that's really nice. And he's like, yeah, those are the two you didn't like. Uh, so <laughs> the kind of things like you're saying that sometimes um, even the compounds that you don't like, uh, the, the components you don't like, uh, mixed with something else, turn into something else or lift something else is I think even better descriptor that you used um, so uh, I'm starting to understand how we can do these same things with hops uh, based on that and it's and it's and this is really sort of the the heart of and this is I mean this is something that uh, Jeremy's alluded to and Vinny's alluded to and well pretty much every brewer has alluded to which is that it's the brewer's art and it's mm-hmm. difficult to quantify yeah uh, it's not going to stop me from trying yeah. but it is. It's one of those things where you just say, "Okay, hang on. I just this just needs a little bit of foot stank." <laughs> yeah. And you're like, "Well, yeah. I, that's a terrible idea because you're taking this bright fruity thing and then you get it and you're like, oh my god, no, it's even fruitier.'" And it's again that concept of the lifter hop, yeah. that concept of the thiols makes your brain. I've talked about the putrescence and, and fermentation and, and all that stuff. Uh, that makes your brain pay attention. But there's also there like we're working on this. There may be actual some 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 some. There may be some changes like you, you said earlier, um, but I certainly know that there are some. Um, holistic perceptual changes and, and effects and impacts that go on with, with the combination of these things. Okay. Um, so, so let's, you want to talk about some of like, educate me on some of these right. actual components so, and changes. So when we talk about uh, principal components and hops, typically it's linalool, uh, geraniol, caryophylline, farnesine, myrcene, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, those are big and they are the 
overwhelming. I mean, myrcene on, on its own is like 50% of most hop oils. Wow. Okay. So it's, it's, it's the vast majority of it. But myrcene dissipates. It's very, very volatile. It's very thermally labile. It will get blown out during the process. It's, it, it's, it doesn't stay around very long. Geraniol on its own is, is floral, and ger hence geraniums, geraniol. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also, uh, we, we, we have reason to believe, not proven yet, we have reason to believe that it is being converted into other compounds such as citronellol, citrol, uh, and so, some and nerol is just an orange oil, and it's not in hops, but it shows up in beer. Mm -hmm. And so, again, slight deviation to by transformation. I'm going to be talking about the ESPC, and we will have a show on that later on with some actual chemists, not just me talking my usual <laughs> rants. Uh, but we are going to have some some serious discussions about this, and we're doing a lot of projects on this, but. We, uh, as Charlie said uh, on the show that was involving Jay and Vinny, um, hops and sour beer, um, biotransformation isn't necessarily so. So the the misconception is that yeast will take up these aromatic compounds that have no real metabolic value to them, mm -hmm. turn them into something else, and then crap them back out again. Okay. And quite honestly, that's a stretch. You know, that fails the Popper's falsification and that fails the Occam's razor, which is that just basically if if you have a hypothesis, you should try to disprove it before you present it. Okay. And disproving the fact that yeast would try to take something up is, is not that hard. They don't actually have the transporters for most of these molecules and the size of most of these molecules. Um, and then uh, Occam's razor is basically, well, hang on, we've got a very volatile environment. We've got pH, we've got pressure, we've got carbonic acid, we've got different organic acids forming, we've got alcohol forming, we've got sugars and all this stuff. Hang on, that's a perfect environment for sh shit to isomerize and just change shape okay. and change characteristics and change flavors. So, just side note, I uh, kind of wandered off on a, on a rant there. But those principal components are really important and they are the majority of hop flavors. All right. And however, they are they have been used for the last... 10 to 15 years, maybe even 20, to define what hops are what. However, if you, you can grab a couple of lots of hops, a couple of different samples of hops and different varieties of hops that are very distinctive and line them up and say, okay, exactly, you know, uh, this much linalool, same parameters, linalool, geraniol, all these caryophylline, farnesine, myrcene, and they smell completely different. Hmm. And it's because... The principal component analysis, or PCA, is very limited. You're just looking at what shows up first and is the biggest and boldest. All right. There's a lot of stuff in the background that is really, really sort of defining. And so up until recently, um, you had to look at sensory data. And you had to have people sit around and come to agreement as to what the terms were and depending on what culture you're from, depending on what country you're raised in, depending on what your, your his, history of flavor is, you're going to use different terms. So it's, it's just a mess. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there, there are techniques to, to work that out, and we're working on those. But basically, if you sit down and say, okay, hang on, this is citrusy to me, but it's Christmas citrusy. So and now I'm picking out something even more particular. Particular. Yeah. yeah. Or this is citrusy to me, but it's unripe citrusy all right then you get like me i'm like y'all this tastes like tang it's fucking great yeah. uh and <laughs> you're like, okay hang on we need to we need to come to an agreement there and, and and combine those things so if you're trying to create um a hot blend you want to pay attention to the major compounds the pca the principal component analysis mm -hmm. and overall and say okay we're going to keep it within this the, these error bars basically um but then you want to get a well-defined uh, sort of field of options within that where people are saying, okay, hang on, here are all the citrusy things we detected uh, out of 200 panelists that are trained. You don't want to do random people because sometimes there's value, but it, that can be a problem because they're not using the same language. Makes uh, sense, yeah. Uh, but out of 200 panelists, 37% said this one, 12% said this one, 2% said this one, fractionate that out, mm -hmm. uh, and then sort of work through it. And you can say, okay, well, Clearly, this tastes like tangerine and a version of tangerine to most people. Okay, yeah. So we're going to define this as that. All right. And then we want to create a uh, tropic fruit salad or something. 
Well, you want some tangerine in there. Remember, you know, and like e- either you can either do 50 tropical fruit, fruit salad, which is the preserved weird peeled <laughs> tangerine slices <laughs> with the, like the, the, the stewed pear and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Or you can do like a fresh, amazing pomelo banana with sprinkled with lime and like salt bay sprinkling his chili powder onto it or something. Uh, and, and it's amazing. And okay. so the idea is to take those top notes. And, the, and that's and that's the, the so, so all of these these things I'm talking about right now, the citrus and the aromatics and all that stuff. They're the first things that you hit. Hmm. And so the first things that you smell are going to be citrusy, Mm -hmm. peppery, minty. Hmm. But, and you're going to smell some of these things later on. Yeah. Um, And uh, again, it's the overripe fruit or or ethyl butyrate and, and, and so on and so forth. Those are all the most volatile compounds, and those are the things that are going to dissipate fastest. So if you're trying to make a dry hopping blend, you're going to want to put a bunch of those in there because uh, you want to make sure that they're – They stick around. They stick around, and, mm-hmm. so you're, and, and it's really a numbers game. And we're, we're working on looking at seeing if, if we can figure out better ways for brewers to get better access to them and, and keep them in the beer. Mm-hmm. But at the moment, it's pretty much just – so just Again, trying it out. I, I apologize to marketing, but add a fuck ton of them, and and, and some of them, <laughs> some, some percentage of that will will, will 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 remain. Well, because of all the variables, right? So I I can, I can understand how difficult it's going to be to, to pinpoint that. It's going to take y'all some time, but um, okay, yeah. So but still, err on the side of going heavy. Err on the side of yeah, yeah. Err on the side of more for the volatile stuff. Okay. Now, then you have your mid palate and your retronasal. And so there's two, so there's the, there's, there's actually, there's a couple of things. There's top notes, which is what you smell. And the first thing that hits your, your, your sensory ex- experience or organoleptic experience of the beer or the hops when you take a first sniff or take a first sip. Those are your aromatic and very volatile compounds. Your mid palate is once you've started to sort of, inhale those and they're going past your soft palate and going down into your lungs and they're going through your sinuses mm-hmm. and you're swallowing the beer you're like okay hang on there's something in the middle there and this is actually for me this is one of the hardest things to quantify as a brewer and as uh as, as a researcher it's like well hang on mid palate is we okay is it flavor because there's only like six mm. salty sweet bitter sour umami is that five that's five Okay, am I missing one? I was thinking, I was waiting for you not to say umami, so you, you stumped me. Okay, we're going to go with five. <laughs> uh, anyway, and, and then, but then there's the interaction of those with the aromatics and then how that works in our brain. So now we're talking about neurology. And so mm. that at that point, the mid palate is really complicated. Yeah. Because the way you experience it, your life experience plus the aromatics plus your flavor profile, that's yeah. like there are words in Chinese and Japanese for flavors that – we as Westerners who've never been there and never learned those languages and, and, and had that food, we don't even experience because yeah. we don't have a concept for them, which is just cool as hell. Anyway. See, you say cool, and, and I get it, but this this is why I will never take the BJCP exam. I'm never going to do the Cicerone thing because it's so difficult in the middle there to like – and listen, I'll admit I'm kind of lazy. But the fact that it <laughs> – that, it, that it's – it's subjective. Uh, there's so many, you know, like you started to ask, is it, is it flavor or is it aroma? Yes. And now, and then it becomes neuro, uh, neurological from there. No, it becomes cultural first okay, and then okay. neurological. <laughs> yeah. And so I just can't be bothered. Like, fuck it. I just, I like the beer or I don't. And, and, and so- I'm still, don't get me wrong. I also find it fascinating. And I find those that are able to refine their palate to such a degree that they can really pick these things out. I, I do find that uh, fascinating, and it's a real talent, I think. Well, it's uh, uh, so this is this is a refrain that I use with uh, my direct supervisor and some of the other C-suite. I'm like, it's not talent; <laughs> it's a skill. Skill, You're not yeah. Born yeah, with this, yeah, yeah. You're, you, you you can have things that that Good call. impede your ability to do this, but this is practice, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you have to get like. So I have had times when you know. I'm, uh, Sweetie, I apologize for this, but when I had started smoking again and then quit and then started smoking again and quit, you know, m- my my aptitude, my skill level right. at sensory decreased. I bet, yeah. Because, you know, I was covering my nose in ash and nicotine. It's yeah. not great. Yeah. Um, but when it goes away, you know, I'm much better. And this is some, some of the brewers I've worked with who just have smoked, it's pretty much 
in the last, I mean, Jesus, I've known them for over 15 years and they just keep smoking. They're still fantastic sensory panelists, but I can't imagine what they would be without with the cigarettes. <laughs> right. This is not, this is not an anti, again, Philip Morris is not no longer a sponsor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, the whole concept is, is that it's really, you're trying to build something that you like and you know what you like. Mm -hmm. You should be able to, not necessarily define it, but at least put error bars around it, saying it is within the. It's not. It's not exactly what I want, but it's close enough. Yeah. And so you you and eventually your error bars will get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, and so eventually you'll have exactly the same thing every time. Um, and I, I would caution people not to. Uh, this is and, and this is me saying this. I would caution people not to resort to only chemical analysis and mm. lab specifications like you want the sensory because we just don't have the resolution or the we, we can't we can't typify the neurology and the human perceptual response to these things yet so pay attention to what to what you smell and what you'd like combine them in the way that you want and then go from there okay. so let's so i'm, the, I'm so wandering off notes, here. now we got to the, now got to mid palate mm -hmm. Okay. Finishing character, which yeah. is um, so there's there's this situation that happens where once you swallow something, you get there's a little bit of sensory stuff that goes on in your sinuses, uh, uh, and there's a little bit of stuff that goes on in the, in the back of your throat, just in the back of your tongue as it's going down, and that's frequently people are like, oh, that's a stringency. No, actually, that's on the side of your tongue, but it's the nerves connect uh, anyway. Um, but you're paying attention to the sip. And after you've swallowed, mm -hmm. and so you get the character of the beer, and then you have a void in your mouth, where all and your mouth is hotter than the beer. I sure hope it is, at least, otherwise you're dying. <laughs> yeah. uh, but then all of those volatile components, and you open your mouth because there's always going to be a vacuum, or you inhale through your nose. All those components get volatilized, and that's called the retronasal, where okay. it goes after you've swallowed, it goes back up into your sinuses, into your mouth, it saturates your taste buds, and saturates your nose, and you want to pay attention to all three of these areas. That first smell, that mid-palate flavor, mm -hmm. and then that retronasal. And I, I like to add a fourth, okay. which is, was it good on the burp? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I thought about that after my last sip. I was like... I was I guess I was almost combining that with the finishing character. Um, I, I would say that's that's the epilogue. <laughs> yeah, uh, the epilogue character. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah the, if it's good on the burp, and that's and that's we used to use that as a as a tongue in cheek, quite literally sometimes. Uh, uh, character or, or quality measure is like, okay, we're kind of split. Okay, show of hands. Was it good on the burp? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh. Yeah, because that's going to show everything. Because that, that's see. not an ideal con condition. And so that's your tiebreaker, is what you're saying. Yes, if if it's, all it, things being equal, your tiebreaker then is, is is it good on the burp? Okay, I got you. You know, and it's uh, well. Anyway, it's, it's a little bit. That's a little bit crass. But basically, <laughs> that whole idea is that you have these layers, and they will interact with your sensory uh, just capacity uh, and your and your organs in 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 an order, mm -hmm. and. What's really annoying, uh, or wonderful, sorry, uh, <laughs> yeah. is that when you get all the hops together and you smell them as a raw component and you combine them together, you can be like, okay, well, okay, I want to, like, this is amazing top note citrus, but I want a bit more, I want a little bit of that, that, that tropical fruit character. Hang on, this one had a little bit of that rotting fruit character, which if I combine it with the citrus and this peach note over here, that's going to give me that tropical fruit character. Ah, but I really want to follow it up with something kind of spicy. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of that green pepper character maybe from like a late harvest, like T90 Equinot or some black pepper from a tonum and some spiciness. Put them all together. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, okay, this this is the hot blend that's going to be amazing. Okay. A real fucker is. Mm -hmm. You're smelling that in the hops in front of you. Now, when you put them into the hot side, yeah. those molecules are going to change. Some of them are going to blow off. So all the ones that you smell are probably going to blow off. So then you have to use the same lot into your dry hop. Okay, okay. yeah. 
and even your dry hop, you're going to get some gas exchange. Some, 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 so you have to learn this. You have to pay this attention is, to this. This is extremely annoying. As a, as a, well, this is why y'all. This is why you at Yakima and 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 some of my favorite brewers are such professionals because exactly what you're saying. You you have to know not only what it smells like then, but what, what it transforms into, you, and you have to memorize that. Essentially, you have, you get to know these things. That's 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 you all being professionals. Well, I very much thank you for that. Um, however, it, it's it's us trying to be professionals, but realistically, scent memory is very, very important for humans. Like if we, we pay attention to it. We remember it very hard. Like when you smell the smell of your grandmother's house, even if you're just walking by somewhere, or uh, the first girlfriend's shampoo, mm -hmm. you know, like or the first boyfriend's cologne, or the smell of the old seats in your weird uncle's 67 chevy <laughs> yeah they all yeah. bring back very very strong memories for yeah me. yeah um and that's great but they're not accurate okay the way we remember things as human beings is that we overwrite our memories every time we recall them i see we and and so we layer on to our experience right the experience that we're currently having so when you recall that perfect beer that you brewed 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago or five batches ago. It wasn't that perfect. It wasn't that perfect. Yeah. And you're layering all the positives. Any, anyway, you, you get you're shattering my whole life's dream right now. Like right. all I can remember is the past being great. And well, now you're telling me it's fucked. Well, <laughs> this, you know, the 80s had some good stuff, but there were also leg warmers and hypercolor shirts. <laughs> right. Uh, well, that early 90s. Anyway. Um, yeah, but, you're right. But the whole the whole point of this is that um, you need to pay attention. I'm trying to give you all the tools. I'm trying to develop the tools to help you all do this better. But you need to pay attention to all of these things and make sure that uh, you learn how your process affects these compounds and how it shows up in your beer. Okay. Um, so you can be very scientific about this. We can be incredibly careful about uh, getting thiols, getting all of these uh, citrine uh, these esters and uh, all of the uh, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, so on and so forth to the exact level. And it's still going to taste different because there's something that's even at a smaller point that's, that's in, 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 in points, you know, decimals of quadrillions that we haven't learned to look for yet, but that was actually aromatically significant. So... Well, and this is why, you know, this is a, it's almost a cliche now that we just say that, you know, brewing is, is science and art. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's neither one or the other. Uh, there, I don't know many successful brewers that are just one or just the other, right? It is science and art to, to figure these things out, to use some detailed knowledge to get to a point, and then some intuition, some of your fucked up memory that you just described to me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's science and art. Well, I, I think there's, there's something important to realize is that it's, uh, there are brewers that are excellent at doing this that are just 100% science-based. And mm -hmm. anybody that knows me will, say, will, will probably gasp when I say this, but those are the people that are making two-spec beer on a vast global scale. And it is... That makes you know, sense. I take my hat off to that. It's yeah. hard to do. It's really hard to do, mm -hmm. especially when you don't have a bunch of different esters from yeast and a bunch of different dry hop compounds to hide behind. Mm -hmm. um, but when you want to create nuance and a great palette of experience for your customers, you need to kind of pay attention to all how this all interacts. Sure. And then, of course, there's the opposite tack, which is... We get drunk at a bar hmm. and say, dude, <laughs> we should make a beer with, like, everything. Everything. And, you know, it's the kitchen <laughs> sink beer or the, yeah, yeah. yeah dude, we're going to do a collab and it's going to be, a, that was 13%. We're going to use right. oyster shells, hope, ice cream, <laughs> yeah. toasted marshmallows, and then we're going to age it in graham crackers i remember yeah. my first beer yeah <laughs> or you know honestly sometimes you know i i, I we do have this we're, we are trying to be scientific and awesome about it but at the same time we also have fun uh so well let me do this let's let's come back and have some fun um we're going to talk about a little bit more of of you know blending on the hop side we got to talk a little bit about uh, blending on the beer side. Right? Oh yes, um, and I think that also can be some of the you know some of the fun part too, right? Mm -hmm. So hang in there. We're just going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back after these words.
Welcome back to the Hop and Brew School podcast. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, so, Nick, we have talked a lot about the uh, the grower side, the, the Yakima chief side, the um, you know the wholesaler side before it gets to the brewer. Mm-hmm. But obviously, there's the beer side of blending. And, of course, it could be a whole show about how we choose what hops go together and things like that. But bridging on what you've taught us about what we do on the on the grow on on your side on the yakima side bridge that to what i do as a brewer um can i is it bridge same, it to what the same jamil <laughs> does as a brewer yeah perfect <laughs> much better idea <laughs> sorry i'm just messing with you <laughs> yeah. man. No. much better uh, idea. have you actually brewed since the last time i ragged on you about not brewing gosh no and i'm about God to i'm it. about to give away my brew system to a lucky brewing network listener who goes to homebrew con Oh, well, actually, you got to go to BNA 14, but um, yeah. So no, I have not. No, actually, should, no. should we all sign it with a welder? I am going to brew at Firestone Walker next week, though. Oh, really? Yeah. Which is what is that? It's me like pushing a button or something? I don't know. Maybe I'll get to throw a bucket of hops in. But. No, it's actually pretty fun because uh, knowing like Matt's on his Matt's on it. He knows what he's doing, and he's right. That's every time right. I've seen him doing a collab like at at, at War Pigs in in Copenhagen and stuff like that, he is. He, he he doesn't leave the brew deck. He oh, walks for sure. around with the entire with the clipboard and like so a lot of like head brewers and stuff are like, okay, minion, go do this. And like, no, no, no. He gets involved and he's if he's inviting you to do a collab, you're you're gonna be involved, which is honestly the right way to do things, and that's cool yeah. as hell. No, I'm excited. Anyway, okay. Um on the beer side. On the beer side. So um what I was talking about earlier, it, it, it kind of directly translates to the beer side. Uh but again, it's from the expression and experience standpoint you need to know what happens when you add hops to your boil to your whirlpool to a hop back Mm -hmm. to a different type of hop back if it has a a greater deal of head space because the more head space the more aromatics you're going to lose uh to uh you know uh, dry hopping hopping during fermentation or after fermentation all of these things matter and mm-hmm. it your system is going to be slightly different and your fermentation profile is going to be slightly different than than what might be in the literature um and so you you, you kind of need to just look at it and experiment and so build on what you know so if you have a, a great pale air, pale oil recipe and you know it works use that as your baseline i see and start modifying based on that increase the alcohol level it's going to behave mostly the same um, up to about, you know, between four and seven percent. It's going to behave mostly the same. When you get start getting eight and above, you start extracting slightly different compounds and dry hops and stuff. Uh, but you want to you, you, you want to sort of quantify all or, uh, quantify is difficult. You want to at least keep a record of all that. And I guess this goes back to what we've said probably a hundred times, one, yeah. which is take notes on what was different. Right. And make sure that you're capturing all of this stuff. But again, you're aiming for what top notes do you want people to smell? What's the mid palate? What's the experience in the mouth? Mm -hmm. And then what comes out um, as you swallow? And then perhaps as you burp because it was was a delicious fizzy beverage. Not all hops that smell the same will behave the same or smell within the uh, or, or, or or you could describe within the same uh, aromatic group mm-hmm. will behave the same in beer so uh for example cashmere public variety awesome on the vine or on the vine sorry it smells kind of lame once it dries it smells like grape soda it's okay, interesting. Crazy. <laughs> it smells just like it's to me at least it smells just like grape soda. Other people have to describe it slightly different, but to me, my experience mm. of grape soda, South America, Fanta grape soda, that's what it smells like. It's like bang on. Right. Um but in the beer, it doesn't necessarily express that way. You have to use a heck of a lot of it to get that character out, but it does provide this lovely spiciness in the background. Mm. Now Can I ask another dumb question? Based on how you're saying I like your idea of if you like your pale ale and you're looking to to do something, you know, something a little different to to use that as a base. Mm -hmm. Is it silly to pour myself a pint of pale ale and actually throw in a couple of the hops that I'm interested in experimenting with 
into the glass and drinking and smelling it and drinking it that way? Am I going to get anything close to the experience I would get if I brewed with those hops? Well, how many beers have you drunk <laughs> lately? I mean, I mean, not lately because New England IPA is a thing now. Uh, that that actually have hop chunks tastes, in the pint. Right. Uh, it tastes like that. Sure. Guys, hop chunks are not part of the haze. <laughs> hop polyphenols are. Future uh, episode. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, Is that helpful? I wouldn't do it that way because okay. you're not dry hopping. You know, the vast majority of people, some people have been dry hopping finished beer, and it hasn't worked out that great. I see. You do want some of the other technical term here, schmutz. Uh, that comes with uh, yeast that's sort of mopping up mm. and other solids. And you actually want the yeast to, to, to glom onto some of the compounds and drop them out. Mm -hmm. um, because they're, they're not going to drop out all the good ones. They're also not going to drop out all the bad ones. But they're going to drop out an even amount of those necessarily. and, and Or not necessarily, but I guess they're going to drop out some of those. And so that, that can actually help clean up mm -hmm. the, the flavor that you're getting. And, again, that comes from experience. I'm, I, I, I don't have an answer for you all to be totally specific. But, yeah. but I would not ever – dry hop a, a pint beer. of beer to, to see what, what about like a uh, and i hear you saying that obviously there's so many other components like yeast being a big factor but malt uh, what a acids hop, so, so even like a hop tea then so is, is not hop a hop teas again so now most hop people who are doing hop teas are doing with water yeah that's okay. what i mean yeah and and the actual sop for it originally was or the standard was distilled water mm. like, well hang on there's no minerals in there mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. know that the minerality the mineral content of the water affects uh, isomerization of alpha acids, beta acids, and all this stuff. And like, hang on, this is not this is not representative. So that's not accurate either. It's yeah. you're gonna. It's like okay, if you want you if you want to smell what a hop tea is gonna taste like, make mm -hmm. a hop tea. Yeah. Okay. If you want to smell what a dry hop beer is gonna make, just get a bunch of freaking kegs. Dry hop each of them. Mm -hmm. Purge them with CO two. Fill them with beer. Mm -hmm. Taste them. Okay. That's. That's the way to do it easy because enough. it's it's real easy. But then you're gonna say, okay, we'll hang out at this level, at this level, at this level. And and I did this for years. Um, this is actually when I started really calling into the brewer network many moons ago when mm -hmm. I was in Mexico. I was I was brewing a ton, and it was just I had the opportunity, I had the time, I had the system, I had the ingredients. I'm like, all right, let's just do it. I was brewing three times a day mm -hmm. and just splitting every batch into three to six kegs. I see. And just doing malt trials, yeast trials, hop trials. Boom, 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 and that's what you kind of need to do. Okay. And honestly, if you have a tap room attached to your brewery, mm -hmm. a single keg that's the same beer but dry up four different ways, people are going to love that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, as a as a as a brewer and as a as as a as a you know person in the hop industry, I get excited by that. I'm like, oh, dude, I will definitely buy four pints. Yeah, sure. Give me a flight, whatever. Yeah, I want to yeah. try these. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, and, and everybody's different. So some people. I, I, you know, ABV and, and all all the chemical compounds have have an impact, uh, and the, sort of the the I guess the beer um, specifications have an impact on, on dry hop extraction and and on hop extraction. But basically, pick what you like. So I personally gravitate gravitate towards about a six to six point five percent beer as a baseline for IPA. Hmm. It's right in the middle, and it gives enough sweetness from alcohol, but it's not cloying. You're not going to get too destroyed if you have, like, four of them. But it has everything that you need to provide a good backbone to work with the hops. Mm -hmm. That's my taste. Okay. It's not everybody else. Some people like – some people focus purely on sessions, and I've had some amazing session IPAs that are fantastic. I've had uh, double IPAs, which taste and smell wonderful, but I can't drink that many of them. So it's a style that I've kind of fallen out of love with mm -hmm. because it's just too much for me. But – Looking and working with all this together, you're trying to create something that is fantastic. And you can, now here's the other thing: you, you don't have to do this before the beer is finished. You can actually take two or three different beers, mm -hmm. treat them differently on the kettle side and the hot side, and treat them differently on the cold side, and then blend them in ratios together to create a synergistic whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. Sure. Okay. Uh, and and then you can because you 
you're mixing three tanks in the bed. You can then dry up even more, which is always fun. Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, just add more. Uh, you're just trying to sell more hops right now. No, I'm not, dude. We, we, we've <laughs> talked about this. I have been very, very, very strict about not selling shit. Um, uh, it's fun. I mean, it's just it's, a, it's yeah. a really cool way to do it. And plus, also, if any of them has diacetyl issues, you can just croison them, and then it solves it really easily. Okay. Uh, but uh, that whole mix is, like you said, with, with Jay, is, you know, sometimes a beer that that has a funk to it actually improves the overall blend Mm -hmm. sometimes the beer that is bright and shiny is Mm one-dimensional and you want something else there it's hard to define but you need to learn it and sometimes that 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 character is depth earthiness stickiness woodiness resinousness from hops and sometimes it's cat piss Okay. Uh, just play with them. Fair enough. Then, of course, there's the time when you're sitting at the bar mm-hmm. in your tap room, six pints deep. Mm-hmm. And you're like, hey, fuck it. I'm going to take the double IPA <laughs> and mix it with a stout. Ah, right, black IPA. Oh, actually, that's pretty good. Yeah. H- hang on. Just a happy accident. Happy? Well, no, not really. It's it's, it's a drunky accident. Uh, but I'm it's, a happy drunk though. So yeah, that's. I mean, hope we all should be. Um, uh, but that's uh, at the same time. Sometimes you 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 arrive at genius, and sometimes mm-hmm. it's also just for fun, and yeah. you just release something ridiculous. Uh, we, sorry, not we, but when I was at Brewdog, uh, James Martin and Mickle got uh, feeling good one night, I believe, and uh, they released a beer called I Hardcore You. <laughs> which was I beat you, which is Mickle's uh, double IPA is uh, high IBUs, and then Hardcore, which was Brewdog's IPA, mm-hmm. and it was a fifty-fifty mix of both, oh. and it was better than either beer. Wow! And we still don't know why, right? But it was delicious. That's uh, great. Though. And it was and it was so much fun. And it was and they were totally different IPAs. All yeah. right. So let me bring us full circle this time. And we introduced a word at the beginning of the episode Ach, yeah. called cluster fugit. I'm just just to be clear, folks, that is a child friendly word. It's cluster fug it. Mm-hmm. Um there's no CK in the middle there. No, it's just G's. Two G's. Two very harsh G's. Um This is a real blend. This is a and real blend. Can you tell me how this name came about? Because <laughs> it sounds like you guys were having some fun with this. Yeah. So um cluster fuggle and nugget are three pretty classic varieties. Mm. And they're not super popular anymore. They all have really good characteristics on their own fuggles is noted for its earthiness mm-hmm. uh nuggets just a pretty general just good one and nice little workhorse there yeah and yeah. and and clusters noted for i believe it's geranial and it's just so like florally character but on their own individually they're not super expressive but they're again they can become part of that moiety that lifts the either the like either provide some profundity with the air, uh, the earthiness, uh, might lift it with some floral character, um, or might just round it out with sort of a, a a West Coast classic, slightly citrusy, slightly piney, just character. Mm-hmm. Um, but we realized we had some acreage and um, two individuals who shall not be <laughs> named directly, but may currently be the CEO and may have been the former CEO and are now is now the C. Oh, oh, okay. no, see, CSO, sorry. Um, uh, hypothetically, came up with may this. have been consuming some alcohol and uh, uh, came up with this. I think it's a great name. It's a great name. And it's, it's actually a pretty good <laughs> blend. <laughs> it's, it's, one of the, it's one of those, like, a blend that came out of being drunk and making dad jokes and puns. Sure. <laughs> and well, it, I'm calling TM for you guys right now. Uh, I think it's actually registered, uh, but <laughs> it's, it is it is getting released pretty soon. Uh, we've got a, a, a mi- an English mild coming out at, at HomebrewCon uh, based on it, and uh, some other cool. concepts to, to 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 play with it. But it's a it's a fun one. There's not a huge amount of it because it was it was like a dude. Let's let's screw around, and have some fun, and make a make a fun blend that represents. So th- these are all parents of some of the biggest varieties that we love. Okay. Um, yeah. And so this is something to to also it's, it's a little bit of a retro. Basically, we're screwing around having fun, and it tasted good, and so we decided to release it. So, <laughs> Well, I think that's a great place to put a fine point on this conversation because uh, whatever you do uh, with, with uh, your blends and, and learning and experimenting and getting the best beer you can possibly make over and over and over again, have some fun with it. And, and Your and, beer will be better for it. And don't get tied to your numbers. And this is, again, me saying this. 
don't put yourself into a narrow pathway with blinders on. Accept the fact that there's going to be variation. Play with that. Use the variety. Use the difficulty. Make variation a key feature rather than a bug Mm -hmm. of your beer. Mm -hmm. And so always try to be improving. And part of that is letting flavor drift a little bit. And because right now, I mean, 20 years ago, would you thought that hazy New England IPAs with this crazy fruit and all this all, all this big oat background and this thick mouthfeel would have been as popular as they are now? 20 years ago, I had my first Sierra Nevada, I think. <laughs> right. Okay, so 10 years ago then. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, damn it. All of a sudden, uh, I'm old as shit. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, me too, dude. We're about the same age. I know. Um, so, I mean, it's just it's one of those things. Like, we, we, never, we can never tell what the beer market's going to do. Yeah. And honestly, I love all of the changes that are happening. So be willing to drift, be willing to experiment, but keep records. All right. And don't trust your memory of the smell. I love it. All right. Well, that's all the time we have today on the Hop and Brew School podcast. Nick, thanks so much for that education as usual. Thank you for hosting me, sir. It's always a pleasure. We will be back with more as promised. The Hop and Brew School podcast isn't going anywhere. Go to yakimachiefhops.com. Wait, forgive me. Go to yakimachief.com slash events and find out all about the actual Hop and Brew School 2019. It's August 30th through September 2nd. I'm going to be there. Nick's going to be there. We're going to have a good time, and we're going to learn a lot more. So make sure you go check that out. In the meantime, tell your friends about your new favorite podcast. Hey. Share it on your social medias. Uh, let people know. And let us know what more we can do for you. You can send us emails to hopandbrewschool at thebrewingnetwork.com. That's hopandbrewschool at thebrewingnetwork.com. We'd love to hear from you. Get us those ideas. Get us some suggestions, comments, whatever. Uh, abuses accepted. Not welcome. But uh, <laughs> definitely please, if there's a topic you want us to dive into or hit back on, bring it up. That's right. All right, Nick. We'll see you on the next one. All right, buddy. Thank you very much. Take care of yourselves and your beer.